Hello everyone and welcome back to our series designed to provide you parent support in navigating virtual learning with your child. Today's learning environment has changed so much and today you need a new set of skills to help your child grow and flourish. In this series, we have been learning all about the importance of motivation, practical strategies that you can implement at home to develop both extrinsic and intrinsic motivation for your child, as well as structures and systems to maintain your child's motivation to learn and grow. So what have we covered so far? We've learned all about the strategies for motivating your child through the ARCS model. If you haven't watched these videos, I highly recommend that you start there. Use the link above. Today, we will have the chance to learn more about the ARCS model of instruction from Michael Despazio. Michael is an author, television host, and stage edutainment performer who specializes in science and science education. His passion for education is unmatched, and he often engages audience in hands-on activities, puzzles, and puzzle solving and even 3D illusions. In addition to hosting over three dozen broadcasts of National Geographic Jason Project, Despezio has performed stage shows at the National Geographic Auditorium in Washington, DC. He has also performed on stage for the Discovery Channel, as well as developing Discovery Channel Camp at the Bahamas Resort at Natus. It's an honor to have Michael join me today to share his expertise in motivating students. Michael, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Kamal. And I have to tell you, it is an honor and a pleasure to be not only with a colleague, but with a friend who I've worked with for many years in the UAE. So thank you for inviting me here. Oh, the pleasure is all mine. And thank you for joining us today. So, Michael, you know, we are creating these amazing videos to speak to parents about motivating students. And I have some questions that I need to ask you. And I was like, Michael is the person that we need to interview and ask these questions. So, Michael, I think it's an understatement to say that COVID-19 has provided its fair share of challenges to parents and students across the world. What have you experienced in the work that you actually do right now? Interesting, because there's been a major change in the last few months. Once vaccinations went out, suddenly opportunities for me to engage with parents, with students and teachers have opened up. What I am finding is that everyone is craving. They are craving for a face-to-face -face interaction. Everyone mm -hmm. seems to be a little bit zoomed out. I, I don't know, Have you? are you zoomed out yet, Kamal? Yeah, exactly, exactly. We're looking forward to start like our face-to-face -face interaction. Yes, and, and that's what I am finding now. So the shift is it's really been a learning curve for many places to see how online education wasn't the panacea, wasn't the perfect solution that we were missing a lot, especially when it came to hands-on experiments and having a teacher or a facilitator actually there to help the student develop not only understanding of content, but understanding of the higher level thinking skills. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I love that. I love that. And am I correct in saying that learning effective strategies to motivate one's children from home is today a necessary skill that the parents need to have? You are 110% correct with what you're saying, especially now as education seems to have moved more back into the home. This mm -hmm. means that teachers or parents need to take on more of a responsibility that the teacher once had. And a critical part of that is motivating the student. Although there are natural types of motivation, internal motivation, kids want to learn stuff. There are certain types of tricks. There are certain ways to improve the way that you can spark and really foster, generate motivation and engagement in your own children. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And motivation is really essential. This is how I think about it. Um, in these days, unfortunately, like many of the parents were asking, like, how can we motivate? How can we work with our children? Are we supposed to teach them at, at home? Like, are we replacing the teachers? Right? These were many questions that teachers ask. And that's why we started the series, which is the uh, Summer, Summer Institute series on our YouTube channel. So, Michael, 
let's talk a little about the ARCS model, or can I say it, AR, I call it like ARCS model of instruction, right? Right. Recently, on the HMH Think Digital First Virtual Series, you shared this model with the parents. And um, I, I was like fascinated. And like, to be honest, I did not hear about it before. And that's why I've started digging into it. But my question to you is, what is it about this specific model that resonates or appears the most to you? Great. Well, first of all, let's take a look at what ARC stands for. And that's attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And what this turns out to be is a roadmap for the most effective way of really grabbing those students and making sure that they're not learning because you're telling them to learn, but they're learning because they want to learn. As I mentioned before, motivation is natural. There is internal motivation. There's also something called external motivation, making the student do something because they're gonna take a test. As you can imagine, much more effective if the student wants to learn and is motivated internally. And what this model does is it lies out the way that you have a student engage and be driven in their learning experience by internal motivation. The first piece is attention. You want to be able to grab their attention. You want to get them right there once they're got once you have their attention then you can take them you can talk about relevance in their world something which is very important why does this why should i learn this well because it's relevant you can talk about the confidence in learning don't worry it might seem difficult now but you're going to be able to master this and not only will you master this you're going to end by saying wow that was cool. I am satisfied about what I'm looking at. And there you have the ARCS, A-R-C-S model explained. Yeah, and, and that was like very simple and directly and to the point. But like when you said satisfaction, is it only the parents' satisfaction with their children? Or is it also the children feeling satisfied about what they've accomplished and did so far? What a great question, you know, and I'm going to switch that around. I think it's more important for the students to feel satisfied. The parent satisfaction will come out, will emerge from the student being a good learner. And that comes in the final stage of ARCS with self-satisfaction that the student feels, wow, I just learned this stuff and it is so cool that I know this now. I am satisfied with what I did. The, stu the, the, the student or the child's facilitator, which could be the parent or the teacher, then looks at this and says, wow, I'm satisfied because it was a success. So yeah, two types of satisfaction. But me, I place that first primary, more important one on student success and how the student feels the experience went. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So you mentioned attention, relevance, confidence, and satisfaction, right? And these are like the abbreviation of the, or the ARC actually abbreviates these four words. Yeah. If I ask you right now to order these according to what you feel is the most important, like do you feel that attention would be coming first or relevance or confidence or even satisfaction? What's well, what will happen in this model is that they tend to build on each other. So that final bit of satisfaction is critical, you know, and it really they fit together really well. So it's hard to tease out which is more important because, you know, some of these pieces will work better with some students. Some won't work at all. So there are some students who love the concept of relevance. And if you're teaching your child or teacher is teaching their student something and it's relevant, these students are going to lock right on it. Wow. Where other ones really, I really don't care about relevance. Just tell me what I need to know. So you can see that it would vary with the specific child. However, the first and most important thing is to grab them. And that is indeed with attention. And that is something I focus a lot on. What are certain strategies? What are activities? What are things called discrepant events? And I should mention a discrepant event. A discrepant event is something which doesn't turn out like you imagine it should. And it grabs your attention. I'll give you a great example. And come on, I bet you don't know this one. See, I've got to think of things you don't know because I know that your understanding is incredible. Yeah, we talked right. about ice cream and making ice cream. And now I hear uh, it's 122 degrees Fahrenheit in, in Dubai. So might be time for some ice cream making. But in okay. order to make ice cream, <clears throat> you use a liquid, a milk. 
Now, it turns out you would think that the colder this solution of milk and sugar is, the quicker it freezes. However, somebody found out that that's not only always the case, that sometimes the warmer solution will freeze quicker. Isn't that incredible? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It goes against everything that we would inherently think. And that is a discrepant event, something which goes against what logical thinking and our understanding would construct. And those are very effective in grabbing children's attention. Yes, yes. And and uh, to be honest, like I did not know that. And yes, um, I've seen that, some- I got something you didn't know. I've seen some videos actually on YouTube where you can see like people in Canada maybe holding um, boiling water and then they throw it in there and then all of a sudden it like changes into into ice or snow, right? But now it makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah, and you yeah. spoke about attention. So let's focus in here around attention. What do you think are some of the challenges um, or the the challenges are in grabbing the students and the children's attention? And what are some strategies that you can suggest to the parents in order for them to overcome these uh, these challenges? Okay, great, great question again. If we're looking at grabbing attention, we want to make sure that it's the student's attention you're grabbing, not that it feels good for the parent. So mm -hmm. it has to be the student's real world, which gets us right back to relevance. So look at things that a child is playing with. Are they playing with soccer? Are they playing with soccer balls? Maybe yeah. there's things with learning how soccer balls move that you can translate into learning about physics, about pushes and pulls. What happens if I kick a soccer ball in one direction, a football in one direction? Will it mm -hmm. go in that direction? Why? What happens if two people kick it at the same time in opposite directions, in the same direction? Do you see yep. what I'm getting at? It, it becomes relevant. The wows, magic. I love magic. Go look at magic books. Look at yeah. all the simple magic tricks that you can make. 3D illusions. Everybody loves that. In fact, I present on that. Look it up. There are so many things that you can find. So I would suggest magic, simple activities. Most students love to be scientists. Let them experiment. Don't tell them what to do. Set it up so that they explore and it is self-driven. That's another important part of motivation. Not telling somebody, but giving them, allowing them the opportunity to self-discover. That's essential to self-discover, right? And yes, I agree with you. I was I was teaching sciences as well, like a couple of years ago, and it's it's always I can say that my students were always with me on track whenever, uh, first off of all, I use like relevant materials, things that they can understand, they things that they can see. And of course, grabbing their attention, just as you said, with magic, right? Things that right. Are, they've, they've never seen before. And that was like amazing and perfect. Or, or wait, I got another one. Or, or wows, like I'm looking at my desktop here and my yeah. desk is full of wows. My desk is full. Uh, look at that. That is a megalodon, a shark that was as big as a school bus. The tooth. Isn't that cool? Imagine how excited you can get students with just having things like this or children. Here's a piece of a meteorite. Yep. Here is a trilobite. An old and you know what? Even I even have a Volkswagen bus if I want to talk about motion and cars and I can actually get this one moving. So you can yeah. see that there's so many different ways bringing things. You know what? Have fun. Don't miss out on the fun. When I first started teaching, they used to say, you know, don't smile until Thanksgiving time. Don't smile until you're two months, three months in. That's not the case. Kids have to enjoy it. So make sure everything's fun. There we go. Another strategy and technique for grabbing and maintaining attention. Yep. Yeah. And that's having fun, having fun always. Right. It's not only even applied in science. We can apply it in math and English and right. any topic we're going to explain or work with our children on. Exactly. So when I was looking, to be honest, when I was looking at the four different corners, I'm going to call them of the arcs model. Um, I thought that confidence was somehow in the top of my list. And let me tell you why. A confident child, um, or when you have a confident ch child in your class, 
he goes beyond the academic su- success. It's about character building. It's about attitude. It's about even personality development, if I'm not mistaken. And when when we are thinking about about and even working towards building a child's confidence, we really are actually shaping and modeling in a positive way, positively. So uh, do you agree with me on that? Or like, do you think that, no, confidence is not that, the, having the students or being confident is not that essential as much as it is like grabbing that tension about as, as much as relevant stuff would make sense to them. Right. And, and, you know, someone, it's going to be like comparing apples and oranges, that the comparison really isn't at that same concept. As you said, these are the basic tenets. When you look at confidence, what confidence is great at is all of a sudden extending it so that not only are you in conf- confident in what you're immediately learning, which might be something in life science, but you build the confidence in that, yes, I can do it. I can learn it. So I can learn that math problem that I was having problems with. I can learn the history. I can learn the foreign languages. So confidence, as you were saying, is critical. And I see confidence as being one which gets applied outside of that learning silo. So you're learning about something specific here. And maybe you're grabbing your attention with something specific there. But once you learn it, once you establish an understanding that not only you understand the concept, but that you can learn, then you become a confident individual and you are confident across the board. Yes, you are correct. Yeah. So so when I was even uh, building uh, one of these videos um, and mainly about the confidence, right, Um, I was also highlighting and speaking about the I can make sure that your student believe or your child actually believes that he or she can do the thing. And I even like thought about the growth mindset, right? And I, I've, I've added different types of questions or different uh, way of the student thinking, which is instead of saying just I can, let's say if the student cannot or the student can solve like one plus one, right? Instead of saying or allowing the student to say, I can't do this, Let the student think about it in a different way. I cannot do it yet, right? Oh, that's great. I love it. That makes so much sense. Yeah, exactly. So, Michael, can you share with us some of the practical strategies to develop confidence in, in the children? Well, one of the things is that you have to really tell the student while they are learning, just keep reinforcing that they're on track, that what they're doing is good. All too often, parents don't do that. They don't give the compliments that the students should earn. Uh, It's interesting because, you know, we go back to basic educational theory. I can tell somebody, do this because you've got to do this, 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 and you're going to get graded, as opposed to, hey, you just did a great job. That is wonderful. And suddenly you can almost feel that rush of really positive neurotransmitters, brain transmitters that are coming out from the compliment, from the awareness, from saying that, you know, you did a great job. Because not only does that release endorphins and enkephalins, which are brain chemicals that make you feel good, but they also help you seed new neural connections, which makes that child a better and stronger learner. So it's win-win. So make sure you're always doing that. Also, Give the student time. Give them wait time. If you ask them a question, don't jump on, where's the answer? Yada, yada. Let them think about it because the more they think, the more they engage higher level thinking. That's that's, that's 100% true. I always say even like praise your student. Make sure that you're always saying good things to your students, giving them positive feedback. Um, and, and even for the children, it applies in the same way. If, if I'm a parent, I always want to push that student or my, my child towards the best, right? Yeah. So that is, that is very essential and important. Yes, thank you for sharing that. So, Michael, um, if we think in these days, like the parents and many of these parents are actually holding down a 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. job and everything right. that comes with raising a family and now even they, are, they need like to managing the home learning, right? And that's a challenge. Uh, they, you will agree with me when I say that these parents are actually super busy, right? So this is my final question. I would say, what would be your advice to these busy parents? 
Well, we have to make it a 27 hour day. So somewhere we have to figure out on putting three more hours in the Earth's spin. Uh, you know, this is a hard situation. There is not an easy fix to it because most people are stressed out. They're stressed out with all of a sudden all the extras that not only does COVID take away things, but also puts in more responsibility, which means the amount of free time that you have really dwindles. My suggestion for this is read and find out more about best ways to teach. Do what you're doing here. Visit Kamal. Take a look at his whole set of videos. Find out from him, and I'm sure you can make contact with him and find out what are some other resources that you might use. The way I think of addressing this is becoming more and more informed. Because the more informed you become, the more options you have. This is an easy one. You know, and I look at it, I was with my wife yesterday talking about this, saying, thankfully, this never happened when our son was in school. But looking at what happens is suddenly teachers who may have never had background in education other than experiencing it themselves have to become facilitators of learning. So, yeah, learn more about it. And that, that's my big suggestion, which will help you um, and find out how to facilitate. Look me up on the web. You'll find out more videos that I've done as well. But I think that could address it. And and, and I, I think that we're gonna even put like some links on the on the video itself, uh, where like those parents that are really interested, and even teachers that are in, interested in knowing more about you, Michael, will be able just to click on these links and join. And yes, yeah. we have plenty of resources. Um, and you might I was going to interrupt you right now here, so I'm excited about this. Week. One thing to look also look at is that, yeah, we'll give you the links. I have all activities that I presented for teachers. These are up online on YouTube that you as a parent can download and do with your children. I explain how to do it. Wouldn't that be That's a question? Yeah. Everyone thinks that as like HMH, as a learning company, we would only focus on educators. We would only focus on students. But with the COVID, no, we are focusing in these days on supporting parents as well. And that's why we actually created all of these series. Um, so, Michael, it has been an honor having you. And of course, we value your insight and your expertise on many topics. You can't even imagine. So thank you so much for being in here. Well, would thank you, you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure and an honor to be here. And I trust what I made sense will help parents, will help all of you become better facilitators. And in the long run, remember, we're looking at that child. So in the end, that child becomes a better learner with lifelong interests in continuing to learn not only content, but those incredible higher level thinking skills. That's essential. That's essential. So thanks again, Michael, and yeah. have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Goodbye. Thank you for joining me in this series. I hope that all the strategies shared are ones that you will enjoy putting into practice with your children at home. I would love to hear about your experiences in developing motivation. Please email us. The address is in the description below. In addition, I would love to hear more about the type of support you as parents need. Let me know via email and we will be sure to investigate these for upcoming videos. Thank you for everything you do for your children. Stay safe and we'll speak soon.